Uh, today I want to start with a test. I want to give you a test and I have a feeling that we're going to get 100% participation, 100% success. Okay, because I know this from since I was eight years old. Uh, young and old will know the story. How many of you are familiar with the story of David in taking Bathsheba, somebody else's wife, committing the sin of the flesh and getting her husband Uriah killed and as a result, the baby that was born out of adultery died. How many of you know the story? Just about everybody, I knew it. Yep. Now let the test gets a little harder now, okay? It's a little harder. I know that I'm not gonna get 100% participation. But how many of you know of David's sin of the spirit that killed 70,000 people. Raise your hand. Well, some of you do. Praise God. That's wonderful. Now, since you're very familiar with the sin of the flesh, let me tell you about David's sin of the spirit, which by far a very serious, deadly serious sin. I want you to turn with me if you have your Bibles and if you don't grab one in the pew in front of you because, um, and you find it in page 657, 657 in the pew Bible, First Chronicles chapter 21, as they say in England, 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 21, beginning at verse 1. Now you got it. Actually, verse one gives it all away. I mean, it gives it away, verse one. And this is where really I want to go today. Satan rose up against Israel. Satan rose up against Israel. Can you say that with me? I want to stop here just for a moment before I even read the rest of the verse. <laughs> Because I want to distinguish between the sin of the flesh and the sin of the spirit, okay? The sin of the flesh is when we deliberately, premeditatively, and willingly do something that we know it's contrary to the word of God. Okay, what about the sin of the spirit? Well, let me tell you about that too. <laughs> the sin of the spirit is when Satan blindsides us and leads us into playing God or acting as if we are God. Now I'm gonna come back to that again and again because this is something that we're seeing all around us in our culture today. It's everywhere, even in many a church. How? How did Satan rose against Israel? The rest of the verse tells you, by inciting David, by inciting David to take the senses of Israel. And you say, wait a minute, Michael. What is this? Does this make sense? And if you really have some issues with that verse, you're not alone. People have thought about this through the years. Uh, the, uh, uh, and, and many would say, well, Michael, this is silly. This is really ludicrous. Uh, how come counting people is a spiritual sin that caused 70,000 people to die? How can that be? I'm going to show you that the sin of the spirit is the grossest of all sin. Now, some of you might still kind of not convinced in your mind. I, I can read your minds. And you're saying, but Michael, census have been taken in Israel all the time. In fact, we, we know that uh, Moses, in Exodus chapter 30, he counted the people. Yes, he did. Moses did number the people when they came out of the land of slavery in Egypt. Then why does David's census why is he taking census? Uh, occurred the wrath of God and, and, and brought this disaster on them. Why? 
I'm glad you asked because I really want to tell you this is the very heart of this message today. So focus with me, please. See, the difference between Moses' counting or taking the census and David counting the people was not the counting per se. It's not the issue of counting people. That's not the issue. It is the issue of motive. The motive, Moses was counting the people that came out of the slavery of Egypt because God asked him to. And he did it in obedience. But David was counting the people so that he may brag about his successes. Are you with me? It's like a person who spent all day long counting their net worth. And they go over it and over it and over it. And, and, and they're counting the next day. They're counting again. And, and, and they kind of bask in their own glory, success, cleverness, and abilities. Look with me, please about something very important. And that will explain to you this, because I know it's hard to grasp, but I, I want to tell you something else about David. Do you remember when David was a young man and his dad said to him, he said, David, take food for your brothers who are at the front line with the fighting with the Philistines. And David takes all the goodies and, and bring them to his brothers. Saul was the king at the time. And David arrives on the scene and he sees this Goliath guy. <laughs> this, this monster, this giant, nine foot tall. This Philistine mocking the people of God. What did David say? I'll remind you, okay? I'll remind you. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who is mocking the army of Israel? Hey, God bless you. Oh, my goodness gracious. That's why I love, I love coming home. <laughs> it's a great congregation. The army of the living God. Not the army of Israel, but beloved, listen to me. Now that David has become successful, now that he's become powerful, now that he's become adored by the crowd, now that he's being praised by the people, this high life got to his head. Beloved, listen, you know this. Sin is sin, right? But there are degrees of sin. And the sin of the spirit is the ugliest of all. And yet, on the face of it, listen to me, on the face of it, most people in our time and in our culture will judge the taking of Bathsheba and the consequences of that sin. They judge it much harsher than by, by, by humans, right? Listen, <laughs> because we all can understand that sin. We all understand it, right? We, we all understand the sins of the flesh. I think if not say all of us, most of us at least. And yet the consequences of this sin of the flesh, four people died. But as a consequence of the sin of pride, the sin of the spirit, seven thousand people died. As I said, sin is sin, but God punishes the sin of the spirit a whole lot more severely than the sin of the flesh. Why? Why is that? Because the sin of the spirit, are you listening? Say amen. amen. Because the sin of the spirit is Satan's speciality. It's his speciality. Satan's stock in trade is to turn the sins of the flesh, if not dealt with, into the sin of the spirit. He uses the trials and the temptations and the tribulations and the things we go through 
to lead us into the sin of the flesh. You remember? And that's been a long time <laughs> in the last message on this series. He, he does. He turns it into the sin of the flesh. And if the sin of the flesh is not dealt with, it's not repented of, it's not confessed and moved on, it will turn, Satan will turn it, he will work it into the sin of the spirit. I want to explain this a little further, okay? The lower nature, uh, all the appetites of the lower nature, whether it be greed or lust or envy or all, all of that stuff, you, you know, I'm not going to go through the litany, will always raise its ugly head. And so for those sins, what do we do? We pray what? Lead us not into... God bless you. And yet these sins of the flesh are small potato for Satan. <laughs> you see, what he really is interested in, what he's really honing in, what he really works on, what he drills for is the more dangerous and more elusive sin of the spirit. Why? Because this is precisely the kind of sin that got him thrown out of heaven. And this is the sin that gives him a tighter grasp on the human heart. Today, we hear incident after incident. I don't know if you read the news like I do. Particularly Christian news. Where Christian leaders whether it be lay people or be pastors or singers who have been preaching the gospel for years, we all of a sudden, first they get drawn into the sin of the flesh. And because they refuse to deal with the sin of the flesh, eventually Satan brings it all the way home to himself, which is the sin of the spirit. How? By turning their back on the truth of the gospel, by denying the word of God. And today, 60% of so-called evangelicals have turned their backs on the word of God. Less than 18%, less than 8%, that's 88% read the Bible daily. Listen, I have known people in this congregation many, many years ago. I have known people where they would not listen about repenting of the sin of the flesh. And they allowed the sin of the flesh to stay in and stay in. They would not repent of it. In time, they ceased to believe that the word of God is the word of God. Satan uses the sin of the flesh and turns it into the sin of the spirit. Isaiah 14, 12 and 15, five times. How many? Five times Satan said, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. I will sit on the throne of God. You see, listen carefully. This is important, please. Because what the word of God is trying to tell us is this. That when I is at the center and not God. I is in control and not God. I decide what is right and what is wrong and not God. I, who judges, become a judge and executioner and not God. I uh, set my own standards and not God. I am in control of my body, not God. And the list goes on and on and on and on. That's the sin of the Spirit. And that is why we are not surprised that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us, his disciples, to pray. Lead us not to the temptation. We don't want to get in the sin of the flesh. And certainly, we don't want the sin of the flesh to turn into the sin of the spirit. Immediately, he goes on to say, but deliver us from the evil one. By the way, only the NIV gets it right. The others said deliver us from evil. But the accurate meaning Deliver us from the evil one. Who is the evil one? Of course. Why? Because one is going to lead to the other. 
Now, beloved, the sin of the flesh, unless they're dealt with, unless they're confessed, and unless they're repented of, sooner or later, they'll become the sin of the spirit. And that is heartbreaking. Here's the disaster of all disasters. Are you ready for it? The sin of the spirit, which provoked the wrath of God, is often respectable. Often respectable. <laughs> you see that very clearly in Luke chapter 15. I preach from Luke 15, I don't know, maybe half a dozen times in the last 36 years. Luke chapter 15 is renowned as the chapter for the parodical story, right? Am I right? Everybody knows. A parodical story. Oh, we know the parodical. Yep. Preachers preach on the parodical all the time. <laughs> it's the sin of the flesh which he repented of and came home. Ah, but preachers and teachers seldom preach and teach on the older brother, sin of the spirit. Are you with me? Yes. Do you know why? Do you, uh, look, don't get embarrassed now, okay? Okay, I'm gonna tell you, but don't get embarrassed. If you turn red, I know you've been embarrassed. <laughs> because most Christians like the older brother. Hello. They are stepping on some toes. Most Christians are like the older brother. After all, listen to me. They have a point, right? The older brother has a point. He has a point. What reward does he receive for his years of faithful labor? Why was such a fuss made of his precocious kid brother returning? When all that kid brother did is waste some of the family inheritance and the family money. Why? You see, you understand, okay? Wasn't he the faithful one who went to church, sang in the choir? I'm glad we don't have a choir, so nobody would kind of say, oh, he's, he's after the choir. <laughs> Do you know what lurks behind the older brother's complaint? What lurks right behind there? Of course you do. I know you do. Spiritual pride. Here's something you can take to the bank. Listen to me. <laughs> you have to exert effort. You have to make effort to commit the sin of the flesh. Right? The glutton he has to empty the fridge. <laughs> the adulterer, oh my goodness, he has to work hard at setting up this illicit rendezvous. On and on and on. I'm not going to dwell on it. By contrast, the sin of the spirit doesn't take effort at all because it's in the mind. It is a very, very possible for the mind to be raked with spiritual pride and yet it's not visible. It's not seen. No evidence of it. It's like a cancer. It's years before the, 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 this kind of malaise will raise its ugly head and say, oh, cancer. It's been in the body. Long time, invisible. And yet, the roots are deeply entrenched. And that is why the Bible calls it the root of bitterness. You know why he didn't call it the fruit of bitterness? Because everybody walk in the street, see a tree, they see the fruit. <laughs> Unless you dig deep, you can't see the root, right? It's, it's, it's deep down. It's deep down. That's why... You, individual, me, we have to dig these roots of bitterness and deal with it. They're underground. Can you see this? Am I making myself clear? Please help me out here. I'm feeling insecure. <laughs> you see, we rightly condemn the sins of the flesh, and we should, and we will. But we are less vocal about those 
that are in spiritual sins. Spiritual sins that are consuming them from the inside. Ah, we go easy on the sins of the spirit. We go easy on spiritual pride. We go easy on gossip. We go easy on envy. We go easy on jealousy. We go easy on stubbornness and bullheadedness. (laughs) My old friend and mentor went to be with the Lord now. The late John Stott of England. Precious man, I've known him since 71. He used to say to his students, I can't imitate a British accent, but he he had a beautiful Cambridge accent. He would say to the students, do you know how to conjugate the irregular verb to be firm? And then he would continue. He said, it goes like this. I am firm. You are obstinate. (laughs) He or she is (laughs) pig-headed. Beloved, the Apostle Paul tells us, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, listen carefully to the Word of God. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and the spirit. The body and the spirit. The sins of the flesh and the sins of the spirit. Perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Here is a reality check that you can apply individually to your situation. Listen, I never stand here and preach at you without preaching to me. This is what I do. Especially this whole series has been something that comes out of my heart because this is something I live with every morning, every day. Give me just samples. I can't cover the whole thing. Every time you think of yourself to be more superior to others, it is the sin of the Spirit. If you got that, say amen. amen. Every time you take credit for your success in your business, every time you think that you're spiritually superior to others, every time you think that you have more faith than others. Every time you think of yourself as more humble <laughs> than others. I, I used to have a, a, a dear friend in my class, was a classmate in seminary. In fact, we, we just saw him a couple of weeks ago when we were in Sydney. And he used to say, I am proud of my humility. <laughs> Beloved, these are the sins of the spirit. There's a whole lot more. But I'm just giving you some examples, just samples. And that is why our prayer is, deliver us from the evil one. Say that with me. Because these are satanic traits. They really are. They're, They're satanic traits, just like lying is. How do we go about guarding against the sins of the spirit. That's very important. This is really the heart. I mean, I can raise the issue. I can point out to it unless I bring you a word from the word of God for healing. It will be just make you feel miserable, right? If a doctor diagnose you and never give you a medicine, that's not a very good doctor. <laughs> Here's the answer. Here's the cure. First of all, we all, all of us, each individually and together, stubbornly, stubbornly refrain from giving ourselves airs. That's A-I-R-S. In case Nick Ayers thinks I'm talking about him. A-I-R-S. How? When God blesses you financially, Don't fall in the trap of thinking that you are blessed because of your skills. Don't fall in that trap. But pray what? Deliver us. So deliver me from from whom? And then start giving generously and ruthlessly. 
to the work of God. When God blesses you with a brilliant mind, thank God that's not something I've been blessed with, but I know others have. Don't fall in a trap of thinking that you have something to do with it, but pray what? then use your clarity of thought without putting others down. When God blesses you with health or even maybe good looks, again, this is not something I I know anything about, but (laughs) do not fall in the trap of perceiving others as inferior, but pray, what? (laughs) Then use your gifts to do God's work. When God blesses you with opportunities to minister, do not fall in the trap of thinking. And a lot of pastors watch us online, watch us around the world. I want you to listen to me, pastors and Bible teachers, and those of you who are having wonderful ministries. When God blesses you with opportunities to minister, do not fall in the trap of thinking that you are the best thing for the kingdom of God since the apostle Paul. But pray what? Then focus on God's plan for your life. When God blesses you with success, whatever area it is, whatever it may be, any success at all, don't fall in the trap of thinking that you deserve this. Not long ago, I was with a friend and he said something. I said, you deserve this. I said, wait a minute. The only thing I deserve is hell. (laughs) That's really what I deserve. Everything else is the grace of God. When you're blessed by any success, whatever you do, do not fall in the trap of thinking that you deserve this. But pray what? Then ask God, for what purpose has he given you these endowments? Amen. Okay, after this brief introduction, I'll get to the message. <laughs> By the way, I said this a few weeks ago. <laughs> My friend was telling me, his 10-year-old turned to him and said, he hasn't st- gone into his three points yet? <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? 10-year-olds taking notes and even realizing that uh, and, and focusing. I, I think they do more than adults, but th- it's all right. I've seen some of the 10-year-olds taking notice, and when I see their notes, I, I literally bring tears to my eyes. Amazing. I thank God for you kids. Here are the three things I want to tell you. They're not three-point sermons. They're three things I just want to share with me very, very briefly as I come to the end. First of all, you have to understand, and don't miss this, we the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we the disciples of Jesus, we who love the Lord Jesus, we have already been delivered from evil. Already been delivered in the past from evil. How? By the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. By dying on Calvary, Jesus saved us not only from the penalty of sin, which is eternal torment in hell, but also the power of sin. Beloved, Jesus has given us every resource we need to overcome sin and Satan. We will succeed if we refuse to entertain the thought of our own self-importance. A statement that's attributed to Martin Luther and um, recently all the books written about Martin Luther, the 500th anniversary of Reformation, we learned so many things attributed to Martin Luther, he never said it, but so I don't know if he said it or not, but I think it's attributed to him. That he said that when temptation comes knocking, I ask Jesus, can you please go and answer the door? <laughs> Whoever said it sounds wonderful. And that is why, please listen carefully, that is why only believers in the Lord Jesus Christ can say and pray with confidence, deliver us. Listen, those church folks and the professing Christians, they can say the Lord's, what they call the Lord's prayer recited all day long. 
Only the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who love Jesus, those who are walking with Jesus, can pray with confidence, deliver us from the evil one. What is he saying? He's saying when we pray those words, we're saying, Lord, Lord, you have delivered me eternally from the evil one. Now deliver me daily. Second thing I want to share with you is this. I told you this is not three-point sermon. There's just three things I'm sharing with you. We are delivered from the evil one because Jesus right now, at this very moment where we are sitting here, is interceding on our behalf with the Father. And he's not just saying, oh, that congregation and church of the apostles. That no, no, no. He's interceding for you by name, by name, by name. Your name is called in high places. You need to remember this. I know you know it, but you need to always remember it. That you are never, 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 never alone in temptation. Can I get an Amen. amen. Even though that's exactly what Satan wants us to believe. That we are alone. It's up to us to succeed or fail. You see, Satan loves to convince us that no one cares. Particularly, his speciality is that he tried to convince you and me and everybody else that God does not care. Beloved, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 tells us he is able to save completely those who come to God through Jesus because he always, always, how many? Always lives to intercede for them. And listen, he does that everywhere you go. It's not just because you're in church on Sunday. No, no. He he does this whatever situation you're in. He does this whatever state you're in. Always you're enjoying Jesus' constant intercession with the Father on your behalf individually. Especially when you pray. Deliver us. Why? Because Jesus already asking the Father on your behalf that he would deliver you from the evil one. He's already asking and you're just in a coming in agreement with him when you ask him. By name. The third and the last thing I want to say to you about this is praying deliver us from the evil one is much easier done in community. Can I get an amen? amen. And, and that's why we say in this church, every, every member, we say you belong and you matter. Listen to me. All of our home groups, all of our small groups, all of our Bible study groups, they all have one purpose. Stand together, uphold each other, encourage one another, uplift one another, spur one another into victory. Now, T.J. Dama did not put me up to this. He really hasn't. But that is truly, truly where the work of God can take place. <laughs> Beloved, in our faith, it's not only a covenant with God, it is that, but it's also a covenant with one another. It's covenant with one another. And that is why every time we receive new members, as I did in the last, last Sunday, uh, will you commit yourself to discovering your spiritual gift? Do you commit yourself to be an active member of the Church of the Apostles? The tragedy that we find in many churches, and I'm not standing in judgment, this is a statement of fact. The tragedy we find in many churches, evangelical, Catholic, Protestant, it's all over the place. They see themselves as a bunch of, bunch of individuals who come together on Sunday.
that they're supposed to come to church 10 minutes late. After all, that's a buckhead etiquette. You don't go on time. No, no, 10 minutes late. And they leave 10 minutes early. You say, hey, I went to church. I went to church. I live across the street from a church, and I know what time is their mass because 10 minutes after the time, I see them running in there. <laughs> no in a million knows. Church is belonging to the community of faith, it's belonging to the family of God. A community that is bought by the blood of Jesus. And because of that, we have a deep sense of responsibility for one another. In this church of Jesus, we are united for mutual encouragement, for mutual accountability, and for mutual support. Let me illustrate this. Something that most of us will understand. Those of us who live in families, I think most of us are in families, some are not. But those of us who live in family know how effectively family members can puncture our pride without harming our securities. We feel secure in the family, right? Only family members can do this. Listen to me. If you have a wife like I do, this month's 51 years marriage. Amen. <laughs> if you have a, a wife like I do, and if you have children like I have, they are truly gifted in keeping my head in a vice. <laughs> Anytime I start having a swollen head, they lovingly tighten the screws. <laughs> you probably can hear it in your house. I'm going to move on, lest I get into more trouble. <laughs> but beloved, listen to me. The same thing should happen in God's family, to which you are committed. Deliver us, in the plural, right? Deliver us from the evil one. Because in what we call the Lord's Prayer, the plural, I mentioned that before we prayed, is very important, it's us, 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 us. We have to live in community. As I've been doing throughout the series of messages, I always conclude by sharing with you some of my own prayer life, prayer time. When I come to this part of the disciples' prayer, I come to the point of praying, deliver me from the evil one. I often say, Father, you know and I know the devil never take one second off. Not on holidays, not sick leave, never. He's forever prowling around like a lion, roaring lion. His sin of pride threw him out of heaven. His tempting of Adam and Eve with that same sin threw them out of the garden. And then I can really fall apart when I start praying this. Lord, while I know, I know, I most certainly know that you will never throw me out of your presence. Yet I know that falling into the temptation will separate me from the joy and the peace that comes from the sweet fellowship with you. You have given me the full armor of God. When we were praying together with church leaders and Monty was praying for me and talked about the full armor of God, I said, have you read my notes? <laughs> he has given us the full armor to stand against the evil one. Help me today to put on the whole armor so that his fiery darts, his fiery darts forever coming at me, forever cut me. Let me tell you something, I know them. 
I can hear them fizzling out when the armor of God is on. I pray that for me, for my family. I pray that for my friends. I pray that for my congregation. And I pray this for all the teams I work with. Lord, I don't want to wander away from closeness with you. And yet I know this is, this is exactly, this is precisely the intention of the evil one. And he will try to accomplish that slowly and subtly. He will try to get me away from Christian fellowship with other believers. Lord, deliver me from this master manipulator and give me discernment today. Deliver me today from worldly pressures that sometimes may even come from well-meaning Christians. Deliver me today from my own propensity, my own propensity to self-deception. And then I want to give you all of the glory, all of the power, which we'll see in the next message. Father, I thank you that you answer this very prayer that you taught us and your disciples to pray. And then, Lord, I pray that everyone who's here in this sanctuary, as they walk down this aisle to participate in the Lord's Supper, be a moment in which they will purpose in their heart, just like Daniel, that they will pray daily, deliver us from the evil one. For I pray this in Jesus' name.